What is the chance that Edward Snowden will live to be an old man? I think his chances of living to be an old man are quite good. I think his chances of returning to the United States are quite poor because, as we all know, he's stuck in Moscow, the White House has charged him with espionage, uh, and he'll he's never not going return anywhere. home. Yeah, he's no. uh, unlikely. The chance that he'll be an old man living a free life? Well, that's a more kind of complicated question. Um, but to answer that, you need to kind of really explore who is Edward Snowden as well as kind of where is Edward Snowden at the moment. He's in the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. He's sort of um, free to communicate. Um, but I, I think his situation is complicated. Recently, a news site published interviews with American intelligence operators. One Pentagon official was quoted as saying, I would love to put a bullet in his head. And an NSA analyst said, in a world where I would not be restricted from killing an American, I personally would go and kill him myself. Now, these former colleagues, are these the people he needs to fear most? Well, he's in the Russian Federation, I think. Um, it, which is scary enough. Which is scary enough, and I think it would be quite hard for the Americans to do anything like that. But what's clear from those comments is there are uh, people inside the American intelligence establishment who, who hate him, who loathe what he's Would you say it's the done. majority that hates him? I think it's complicated. I think there are some people inside who actually are supportive of what he did and what he set out to achieve, which was essentially to expose mass spying, not just of kind of bad guys, but actually of everybody, you, me, Europeans, civilians. Americans, Brazilians, civilians, and so on. And so um, he started an enormous debate, um, which has raged in the US, not so much in Britain, where I'm from. It's, it's been huge in Germany, just next door. So it's an important conversation. I think some people are sympathetic, but I also think a lot of people are vengeful. Yeah. Um, you work for The Guardian. You were also a correspondent uh, for that newspaper in Russia. And in your book, you suggest that he is not able to lead a normal life in Moscow, due in part also to Russian pressure. And you write, he was a guest of the Russian Federation, whether he liked it or not. And in some sense, it's captive. Now, why captive? Well, I, I think you have to start from uh, a basic premise, which is that I believe uh, that Edward Snowden is not a Russian spy or a Chinese spy or a North Korean spy, that what he did was the sort of... Those are stories we've heard. Yeah, yeah, it was a sort of solo project. In other words, he was outraged by what he saw as an intelligence analyst, um, took a whole load of documents with him, fled to Hong Kong. Uh, and the plan originally was to go to Iceland or to Latin America, um, but he got stuck in Moscow, uh, and the Americans revoked his passport. Um, and I, I've seen no evidence, and he says also that he has not cooperated with Russian intelligence. But at the same time, speaking as someone who lived in Moscow for four years and got actually kicked out of the country, um, it, it's clear that even if he's not interested in uh, Russian spies, they may be interested in him. Was Edward Snowden, in your opinion, ever an average American kid? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, he was average insofar as he's from a, a generation that grew up with the internet and is passionately attached to it, that, that spends much of his life online. Mm -hmm. um, his young life already. His young life online, and actually mm -hmm. I think now as well. Um, but he's not average insofar as he, he, he's, he's a brilliant guy. He's got amazing computer skills. Um, he's technically very gifted. And, and it already was, as a child? Yeah, I mean, at age 18, he's, he's chatting, he's blogging about hosting his own web server, he's asking quite sophisticated technical questions. So mm -hmm. it's clear that he's, he's not your average person who just logs onto Yahoo and Google. Was he a classic computer nerd, a loner in that sense also? Well, I wouldn't say he was a loner, but he was someone who, whose life was mediated through the Internet. And it was these skills that actually enabled him to kind of knock on the door of the U.S. intelligence agencies and, and to get a job, even though actually his school... He record, dropped out of high school. Yeah, he was a, he was a dropout. His parents divorced, um, he, he, he dropped out of school, he never went to university, uh, and yet within about four or five years he's working for the CIA um, in Switzerland doing, seeing sensitive stuff and doing a sensitive mm -hmm. job. In 2003, the US-led invasion of Iraq inspired him to join the military. Um, he wanted to serve his country, he said, join the special forces. That turned out to be a disaster. What happened? Yeah, this is a pretty kind of quixotic uh, episode in his uh, biography. Um, bear in mind that Snowden is someone of the right. He comes from a conservative background. Um, a, he's a supporter of Ron Paul, a kind of famous American libertarian. Um, and For he, our European viewers or Dutch yeah. viewers here, how would you um, say that a libertarian fits into the European scale of politics? Well, it, it's very much a kind of American idea rather than the European idea, but it's definitely of the conservative right, someone who's against the federal government, against big government, uh, against gun control. Against gun control mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so he comes from this background um, and even though he's rather short-sighted, a little bit nerdy, he tried to join these elite uh, regiments of the American army and uh, after two months he was kicked out.
He broke both legs as well. I he heard. broke both legs and um, so on. But you can see the patriotic kind of um, Well, exactly. Idea. He wants to serve his country. That was an important thing for him. Yeah. In your book, you trace the um, intellectual development of Edward Snowden, his awakening to his cause, ultimately leading him to become the biggest whistleblower of all time. And what's interesting is that you see him change his mind radically. Now, how would you assess him in 2009 when the process starts? Well, 2009, he's, um, he's in Switzerland. He's got his first kind of uh, major job at the CIA. He's the sort of tech guy, the guy who sorts out the computers, mm -hmm. the air conditioning and so on, based in Geneva. Um, and at this point, he's against whistleblowing. He complains about an article in the New York Times, uh, which he thinks discloses details of operations in and Iran. He's very outraged. The things he's he very outraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, this is anonymous, bear in mind. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, you know, we can't, we can infer stuff, but we can't be too kind of judgmental, I think, about mm -hmm. it. But he's, he's anti-whistleblowing. He is um, against WikiLeaks, uh, which is interesting because his story and WikiLeaks later kind of intersect. Of course, only a few years later. Only a few years later. Uh, and um, really, I think he sees the world through this kind of parochial American prison. I mean, he complains about the cost of hamburgers in Geneva, the fact you don't get tap water at the table. But there are things he likes as well. He likes the Swiss attitude towards liberty. Something happens in Geneva. <clears throat> um, he's working for the CIA. He's being around CIA officers. And he says at a certain point, much of what I saw in Geneva really disillusioned me about my government. I realized I was part of something that was doing more harm than good. What experience did he have there that made him have this feeling? Well, I think a couple of things happened. First of all, he kind of quarreled with his superiors, basically, and, and this is important because it, it, he came to the conclusion that he couldn't trust the system, that if he complained upwards, that nothing would happen. Or he would uh, get punished. Or he would be punished. And secondly, he saw more stuff. Uh, he, he, uh, he was a sort of CIA guy looking at computers all the time, and he mm -hmm. stumbled across various documents. Um, uh, including presidential directives which reveal, for example, that the Americans were doing offensive cyber operations. So having complained that the Chinese and the Russians were hacking American computers, they were it turned out the, the US thing. was doing exactly the same mm -hmm. thing. So <clears throat> there's this sort of... These were documents he was allowed to see, though, things he was authorized to see. Well, we, we know subsequently that, that he was working, <clears throat> after Switzerland, he went to Japan and then to Hawaii, where he was a systems administrator. So he had far more freedom to kind of roam around this top secret system than most people. Uh, there's some debate as to how exactly he scraped the servers of the NSA, but what we do know is that he ended up taking an awful lot of documents, tens, tens of thousands of them. Yeah. One document that pushed him over the edge um, was a report on how the Bush administration carried out its illegal wiretapping program after 9-11. Was that the click in his head? I think there were several clicks, but that was certainly one of them. He, he was outraged that, that the Bush administration had done this, but not only that, but no one had been punished. In other words, this program of illegal wiretapping had sub subsequently been made legal by Congress, but he felt that people should have gone to jail, and of course, nobody did. Mm -hmm. Was it becoming already in Geneva inevitable, in his opinion, to become the whistleblower he is today? I don't think so. I think we know that, that uh, Snowden didn't vote for Obama. He was not a fan of Obama. He quite liked uh, John McCain. Mm -hmm. um, but he had some faith that maybe Obama would reverse this system. He was hoped he would change yeah, yeah. the mistakes Bush had made. Of, of what Snowden believed was kind of unconstitutional spying, spying that went beyond the remit of the American Constitution, which he, which he cares deeply about. And, of course, that didn't happen. What we saw is that under Obama, the sort of surveillance state got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He was disappointed, um, basically, and disillusioned. He was disillusioned. And so he felt he couldn't complain upwards. He felt um, that this wasn't being reversed. Um, he felt senior people responsible for oversight in the US were lying to Congress. Um, and so he hatched this crazy plan to leak all this stuff. His intentions were already manifesting themselves in his time at the NSA. His colleagues remember his, uh, him as somewhat of an eccentric. And he wore a sweatshirt to work with the logo of the NSA, which is an eagle on it, only he wore a different version of that sweatshirt. And the eagle is wearing eavesdropping headphones. And he kept um, the American Constitution on his desk to argue with colleagues about privacy and civil rights and liberties all the time. He was already showing the signs, I would say, or playing around with them. Yeah, I mean, the sweatshirt is kind of fascinating. I guess his colleagues thought this was a kind of ironic joke, whereas, in fact, I think Snowden was deadly serious. Um, it was a very, uh, very clear message, I'd say. It was a very clear message, and, but I think what's interesting is that kind of no one picked Snowden up. In other words, you'd have thought this great spying agency would be better at looking at his own He was people. wearing a sign, Luke. Yeah, yeah, he was wearing a sign. But, but no one picked him up, and more to the point, when he was scraping this material, sitting in Hawaii, this Pacific island, uh, hacking into the service thousands of miles away, 
nobody noticed. It was, it was as if the world's most powerful, you know, the spying organisation had gone off and Strange. taken a cup of coffee and was just chatting. Having a nap. Having a nap. He decides to, to take a job at Booz Allen Hamilton that will grant him even more access to NSA information. This was all with one goal in mind. He already knew why he was taking this job. Yeah, he moved to Hawaii in March 2012. And by that point, I think it's pretty clear that, that he had this plan. And we know that he was contacting um, journalists. Um, uh, Glenn Greenwald, my Guardian colleague, he, he was pinging anonymous emails to in December 2012. Telling him, I have information for you. Uh, saying really cryptic, like something out of a sort of John le Carre novel. I've got something you may be interested in. This won't be a waste of your time. So he's, he's reaching out to journalists and at the same time he's getting hold of more stuff. So he takes this job uh, and he's, he's exfiltrating data from the system.